all the ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm really pleased to have this fantastic uh, uh, gentleman uh, together with me in this fireside chat, Ben McPherson, one of the leading persons when it comes to the Scottish digital government. And Scotland has been always uh, as a role model for many countries and ourselves. We've seen a lot of, lot of uh, interesting things happening over there. And we are glad that we now have a person who is in charge of this and who can share with us on uh, really, you know, fundamental things. And Ben, I would like to start our conversation with like really structured way to understand what it is, this uh, digital transformation for the Scottish government. Uh, in other words, what are the building blocks? What are the critical elements uh, in executing this transformation? What exactly it is and what steps need to be taken? Thank you. And first of all, it's uh, really great to, to be with you and to have this opportunity to discuss and to, to share together our experiences. And uh, I think it's important to come from that point and to emphasize First of all, you know, between Lithuania and Scotland and uh, other parts of Europe, how, how much friendship and partnership we share. And of course, um, here in Scotland, we have, you know, um, over 200,000 people from across the EU who live here, uh, including 17,000 uh, Lithuanians who are incredibly welcomed uh, and deep connections going into our history. So uh, I just want to express that as we start off and just emphasize that. Uh, this discussion and, and, and the, the whole um, wider discussion that we're having, uh, I hope, um, is s symbolic of the connections that we share. And, and I'm glad that you, you, you still see Scotland as part of that, because uh, the Brexit that's happening that we didn't vote for and, and don't agree with um, is, is not what uh, Scotland wishes. Uh, and Scotland wants to remain as close to Europe as we can and, and, and in close to our friends in Lithuania and other places. So thank you for the chance to to discuss all of this today, but I wanted to just express that sentiment in the first instance. Of course, you'll know that um, Scotland uh, at the moment, it, our, our government is devolved. So the amount of powers that we have to impact and influence change at legislative level are limited. But over recent years, we've really tried to push the digital agenda using the levers that we do have. And the first aspect that, you need, and we've learned this, both my ministerial colleagues before me and also uh, who had this role before me and also my, my, my wonderful officials, is that you need to start with a vision and a strategy and a digital strategy in order to, to prosper in an increasingly connected and competitive world. So that is where we, we, we started in 2017. We updated previous strategies and, and brought them together to take into account improvements in all those areas and to set out a vision and a vision to the country, ensuring that Scotland was recognised within itself and out with Scotland uh, throughout the world as a vibrant, inclusive, environmentally conscious, open, outward-looking digital nation. And that required us to collaborate with experts here in Scotland and elsewhere, um, and the development of implications of the new and emergent technologies, such as uh, the Internet of Things, cloud computing, sensors, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. And this process also demanded that we challenge old ways of thinking. Uh, and I know that's, that's a huge part of the wider discussion in digital, of course, uh, and to challenge those old ways of thinking about the services we offer as a government to the nation uh, and the organisations that deliver them, so the different avenues and different aspects of the state. Uh, and now in 2020, uh, we are, because of the, the pace at which digital is moving, uh, we will refresh that strategy in order to take account of the extraordinary developments uh, that the COVID crisis has brought about and the way that our organisations and institutions have just had to make that jump um, to, to different phases of, of, of delivering digital public services um, in, in a way that was, was unexpected. So in terms of refreshing our strategy this year in 2020, uh, we're about to consult because you know, we want to listen to others, we want to reach out to others. Uh, so we will consult on the next iteration of this strategy. And this will be a collaboration, not just by national government. Here I'm sitting in the Scottish Parliament, uh, 
we'd like to show you the view out the window, but I'm, uh, of beautiful Edinburgh, but I'm sure, uh, uh, I'm not sure it would come across uh, over the camera, but, um, you know, uh, once things are back to normal, you're, you're all welcome to, to come and, and, and see Scotland for yourself. Um, but, you know, uh, how we take this, this, this forward will not just be about us here in national government and in the national parliament, but also about local government. So about the different aspects of the state through society and making sure that we're working together to deliver services in the best possible way. And, uh, you know, that's making sure it's, it's collaborative and designed around people. The size of our country, uh, just over five and a half million people, enables us to bring leaders from all parts of society together and to work in that collaborative way on a shared vision because uh, we, we need to work together. And we are committed to doing that to ensure that uh, services are de designed to meet the needs of the user. Um, and, and that's, you know, we've always got to think of the citizen and how they utilize uh, the digital services and the services generally and that digital plays plays into that inclusive accessibility uh, mean uh, focus of, of what we're doing. Uh, we'll also need to cut across boundaries between service providers. So thinking about how different providers work together uh, to deliver economic recovery uh, to, to, to help people first and foremost, uh, but also to meet our climate change targets uh, and to ensure that everyone in Scotland has the skills, connectivity and devices required to fully participate in a digital nation. And I know that is a challenge that we all face. You know, how do we make sure that, you know, it's not just a portion of the society that's moving forward, that we're taking as much of society forward as we can. So the pandemic and our response to it has shown that the public sector uh, needs to be able to act at speed. Uh, to develop and deliver new strategies. And it has shown, again, the importance of working in partnership with businesses, the voluntary sector, and uh, the Scottish government to, to get the right support to the right people in the right ways. And of course, as well as being a minister in the Scottish government, I'm also a member of the Scottish Parliament for an area, uh, and an area here in Edinburgh, actually. You know, and I've seen firsthand how those different aspects, business, the voluntary sector, government, have all had to come together to help people on the ground. And it's remarkable uh, when you see it. And at this time, we've also seen um, more and more of our businesses move online uh, and rethink their operating models just out of sheer necessity uh, in order to continue to, to, to get their products to market. Uh, and it has given more and more people the confidence to use and benefit from digital technology across all age groups. And we've all seen how older people have had to embrace uh, mechanisms like the one we're talking on uh, today uh, in order to, to have that contact. Um, so uh, that's been really important and it's made it more and more obvious that exclusion from the digital world uh, is something that we that really has a detrimental effect on, on people and can, can, can limit their life, life opportunities and in some, in some cases, uh, their life chances. But despite all of that, as of yet, we, we may not fully understand the extent of the economic and social shock we have experienced until uh, we are able to reflect on it in due course. Uh, but we can and must understand and respond to the incredible opportunity uh, out of this very sad and troubling and difficult time that the, the current circumstances also present us with to build a digital, uh, to build digital countries. And, and for, for us here, that means to, to build a digital Scotland uh, and one which geography, and of course we have quite a, um, although we have some, some major cities, we have a lot of rural and remote communities, island communities. So, you know, Geography, background, or ability should be no barrier to getting online and benefiting from digital technology. We have the opportunity to reinvent our public services, to make them more personal, accountable, adaptable, efficient, sustainable, and worthy of public trust. And that's very important. Our government and our, our local governments, or our councils, as we call them, uh, there's an opportunity to transform them into true digital organizations uh, in, in, in the ways that, that, that other countries have. 
uh, with digital skills, cultures and operating models. In the business community, um, Scottish businesses have an opportunity in, to embrace the economic, economic opportunities of digital technology uh, and marketing ways of working and how that can help benefit not just productivity and business performance and innovation, but also quality of life. And I think, you know, the importance of quality of life and digital's role in that uh, and, and, and the way that the whole uh, pandemic, the whole effect of the pandemic on all of us has focused us on what's most important. Uh, so how, how, we, how we use digital to increase well-being uh, is incredibly important. Um, we also have an opportunity to help prepare our children for the workplace of the future. And training and skills development um, needs to be available for, for the existing workforce as well, so that we're not leaving people behind. In Scotland, you'll know that our tech sector is a very innovative, innovative one and a successful one internationally, um, in, involving a whole range of enthusiastic partners and a network of digital and data talent. We're very proud of what Scotland has achieved in tech so far and what companies operating in Scotland have achieved, but there's much more to do. And, and, and in this, you know, this place of the enlightenment, there is even more that, that tech can bring um, from Scotland and, and, and how we combine quality of life with innovation together to create that hub in energy. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's a lot that has emerged from this crisis, um, but for us, it's just, emphasized how much more there is to do mm. and uh, you know a generation on from when the internet began uh, and uh, you know this whole process has been accelerated by the covid crisis and and actually making the move uh, to to becoming an even more digital country uh, is 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 the next step uh, but to do that in a way that maintains public trust that is inclusive and that is about well-being and the common good at the heart of it, as well as economic performance is where our focus is. Well, so I hope some of those reflections are, are, are of, of interest, but um, it's, yeah, it's an exciting yeah, yeah, that's, time. That's really interesting. I mean, listening to you, I really now can justify why Lithuanians so much in love with Scotland and why they are moving. I mean, that's really inspirational to hear uh, on so many aspects being covered in the digital transformation plan and the Scottish the Scottish digital uh, strategy. And you have mentioned several very, very key components like uh, skills, culture, operating models. And I would like, you know, a little bit to dive, uh, deep dive into those, especially on the skills. I mean, we've seen, uh, uh, you know, younger generations picking up quite easily with technologies. We've seen many very interesting programs when it comes to the elder population. But I'm really wondering, how do you deal with the public servants? I mean, who are at the center of those transformation? Uh, how do they, you know, take the technology? How do they themselves, you know, close this technology uh, gap that appears uh, nowadays? Uh, absolutely. And, and, and we've been on a journey with how we, how we improve our performance in that regard. And perhaps I can, can take you through it because without doubt, governments and public sectors across the world rely very largely on long established traditional systems methodologies and practices um, you know as when i became a, a minister a number of years ago you know learning how the civil service for example works has, has, has you know was something that was you, know, you could you could see the history and how everything was 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 was, was performed and, and that's about function and about um, efficiency uh, about good governance and, and, and transparency and, and of all of that's important and we want to maintain it but those kind of traditional systems and methodologies and practices also need to evolve and increasingly over the last decade uh, we have seen an uptake here in Scotland in an in interest in making processes more effective um, more efficient and more fit for purpose um, and of course we've seen that in the private sector as well with businesses increasingly moving to, to paper-free um, ways of operating, um, trying to streamline their administrative practices, making sure that their processes and systems are ahead of the game rather than always having to catch up 
Um, so we've already seen this in, in the private sector to a large extent. So it's how does the public sector also play its part? And we are very conscious of that. Um, so uh, the, the public sector is, is primed for, for digital transformation and, and evolution. So the key to unlocking this value, we believe, relies uh, and lies in programs that better interlink startups and government uh, and, and help push that process. So, for example, the buyers and suppliers in GovTech are, are at opposite ends of the risk and innovation spectrum. Okay. As such, the role of um, bridging programs between the public sector and innovators becomes essential. And this has led uh, to the establishment of GovTech programs by governments across the world. And uh, that's you know, something that we've sought to learn from, but also play a very uh, active role in. So our current COVID-19 crisis has demonstrated the innovative application of digital data and technology has been crucial to the success of countries' responses. And we've seen that um, here in Scotland and, and elsewhere, that this innovation has been largely generated from smaller companies. Um, so the mechanism by which these innovators have come to governments are either through offers of help uh, or collated in uh, large hackathons. Uh, and so, you know, the GovTech program uh, have been at, the programs have been at the forefront of, of, of technological uh, innovation uh, and, and driving that hunger for change and that, that development. But coming back to your point about innovation culture, um, what we've what we've asked ourselves here in Scotland is what what is our attitude to risk? What is our ability to collaborate across boundaries? Uh, and how do we pull these elements together for the benefit of everyone and the, and the common good so that sectors are working with a shared purpose? Uh, and that risk is addressed by skills and incentives. And that incentive doesn't necessarily need to be economic, of course. It can be you know, aspirational and, 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 and ethical and, and based in values uh, and wanting to improve uh, society. Public servants and governments are often derided for being risk averse. Um, a good thing in many ways, but uh, also something to, to consider about how, how evolution takes place. Uh, but a large part of this, uh, of course, is to do with the confidence to take intelligent risks. Uh, and it's not that people don't want to take risks. It's that they sometimes don't know how to. Uh, and the system doesn't necessarily uh, provide that incentive for them to and reward them to. So in order to run transformation programs which involve risk, we believe that you have to give civil servants the right skills um, and give people the right skills and then confidence grows and that that confidence comes, uh, with that confidence comes the willingness to, to push boundaries. Uh, so there, there's always been a debate around risk and failure in public service delivery, but a huge part of innovation is about failure. Um, and, and you don't often hear politicians say that, uh, but inventors and product developers learn from what goes wrong uh, as much often sometimes more um, or, or what goes right uh, than what goes right. So the key thing for public servants is, is, is being able to, to, con to consider our problems within that, that same, uh, those same circumstances and that, that same uh, set of evaluations. So earlier in the design process, uh, we need to be able to test and explore using the principles of agile methodology uh, to ensure that we gather feedback uh, all the way. Um, and then uh, so that if we fail, we then learn from that failure and, and, and develop that into, into the solutions that we want to achieve. Um, but also we need to co-design and collaborate. And we've been very focused on that in Scotland because the more we create a shared experience that meets our needs, the less we are likely to, 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 to fail uh, or to, 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 to fail in a way that, um, that is problematic. Um, because if we collaborate, then we can, we can have that constructive uh, development um, from any mistakes made. And uh, 
we also need the system to disincentivize. Uh, we, need, we need to consider the system's uh, tendency to disincentivize risk, as I mentioned earlier, um, and instead try to create environments where where that can happen uh, and where programs, uh, GovTech programs, play a really important role in that. And that is where here in Scotland, our program CivTech, which is our name for our GovTech uh, program, uh, comes to the fore. So maybe just say a bit about two examples that that we think are addressing that confidence and skills gap. I'll come to, come to CivTech as a, in a moment, but first of all, I'll just mention our Scottish Digital Academy. So in 2016, uh, we set up the Scottish Digital Academy to provide high quality learning programs to develop and grow the capacity of the Scottish public and third sectors uh, and to maximize the use of digital technologies. So by equipping our people with digital skills that they can uh, fill key roles in our public sectors uh, projects and programs with, this helped uh, by e equipping them with, with through courses that cover agile methodologies, data usage, ethics, importantly, uh, and how to be digital champions. Um, and that digital champions program was important because uh, it helped build awareness among public sector leaders of the transformative effect of digital technology. It also gave them increased knowledge and confidence to promote uh, the digital agenda within their organizations. Uh, and also um, this led to over 270 of our senior management a good chunk of our, our civil service uh, across the public sector having participated uh, in these in this academy and our progress to digital transformation across the public services um, is linked to the alumni of this program. So the Scottish Digital Academy in 2016 really helped in terms of developing um, our, our management across the public sector in order to, to take the arguments uh, and, 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 and the, the policy delivery forward. And then also secondly, the example that um, I think is important is the the, the CIF Tech uh, Public Entrepreneur Programme, um, because um, this is about mindset as well as skill set. Uh, so, uh, of course, um, over the because the skill set doesn't necessarily mean they're in the right mindset, and we need to we need to take people through that through the CivTech Public uh, Entrepreneur Program. Uh, so over the course of four years. Uh, of experience through CivTech, we have uh, explored the characteristics of successful entrepreneurial organizations who thrive in, in, in uncertain and disruptive conditions, much like we are experiencing at the moment with the COVID-19 crisis, and how these tools and techniques can be applied to our public organizations. And this has been really positively received uh, as it is so different to what public sector is traditionally exposed to. Um, so it's laid solid foundations of an innovation culture uh, and why our, our uh, strap line has become in, in terms of CivTech mindset before skill set. Um, so that has really been uh, crucial in terms of unlocking that innovation, but also for uh, nurturing that sense of collaboration, which is so important because the other key ingredient of innovation is the ability to enable free-flowing collaborative ties, uh, which of course is, is, is what this program of, of discussion is all about to, to a large extent as well, because it, it's not the public sector officials who don't want to collaborate. It's sometimes they don't know how to collaborate and indeed with whom. So um, we, we no longer... Uh, think it's effective for governments to send out a questionnaire and, and say they've collaborated. You know, consultation needs to be more than that. Um, so collaboration is about building deeper ties across the ecosystem of government, which are and to make sure that those ties are are constantly alive and, and, and creating that, that that innovation and that 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 engagement. Um, because a nation that really grasps and maintains collaboration between public, private and third sectors, academia, 
citizens groups, communities, investor groups, that is the one that 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 is how you 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 improve the quality of life, which I talked about earlier, yeah. but also how you uh, attract talent, uh, attract investment, create export opportunities, develop productivity, and this is why it's been so important for us to to build on the collaboration and the learning that we've we've experienced so far. And that's why we're revising our digital strategy with local government, as I, as I mentioned earlier, and others, um, and so that we make sure that we're bringing different parts of society uh, to, to, together to work on shared societal problems. Um, so, uh, I mean, CivTech, in, in case you're not aware, fully is, like I said, very similar to GovTech in Lithuania. And it's wonderful to see the GovTech program mirroring much of what we've done with CivTech in Scotland. Um, very humbled by that, and, and, and glad to see that that that, inter, that international and collaborative sharing. Uh, and I know how much of um, our team here in the Scottish government and the wider Scottish uh, digital uh, development uh, sector enjoys collaborating with yours, and, and we're very pleased about that because we set up CivTech in 2016 to solve three key questions uh, because in a, in a world of technology where technology moves quickly um, we, we wanted CivTech to think about how do we procure and how do we solve problems that we don't necessarily know exists so how do we create that innovative space to, to think forward um, secondly how do we leverage the purchasing power of the public purse um, to deliver better public services and deliver uh, economic development opportunities uh, through procurement in a, in a smarter way. Uh, and more fundamentally, how do we build the capability, the capacity and the culture within public servants to take intelligent risk, as we talked about earlier. Uh, so to move people from a place of risk aversion to uh, risk receptiveness, and I should say responsible risk receptiveness uh, as, a, as a Muslim in the government. So our, our, our CivTech, it brings together public organisations with problems or challenges. Um, and to date, CivTech, uh, we have run you know, 47 challenges across organisations, right across the public sector, health, environment, transport, cyber, education, tourism, to, to just name a few. Um, and fr from internal government challenges to citizens uh, facing uh, citizen facing challenges, we uh, you know, span uh, the GovTech and CivTech. Um, and the CivTech programme, of course, is one of Scot Scottish government's unique res response to the growing CivTech, uh, GovTech market, rather, uh, embraces the, the entire spectrum of possible end users from products and services exclusively for use internally at public sector, or, uh, public sector organisations uh, through to those that may be funded and developed by public sector organisations but are firmly focused on the citizen. And that's the CivTech aspect that enables that collaboration between two parts of society that would otherwise um, find it difficult to interact, startups and government. Um, and one participant has, um, I remember um, really interestingly, uh, likened the program as being uh, together uh, two plus ends of a magnet almost, mm -hmm. uh, having, that, having that effect. So there's a variety of different... Um, examples that I could give you about some of the, 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 the uh, problems that CivTech has solved. But uh, I mean, that um, could take some time. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a range from you know, how, uh, how do we help facilitate repairs of buildings between neighbours to flood warning systems and how do we um, make sure communities are, are informed if there's an emergency flood coming to um, thinking about how uh, consumers understand which activities and lifestyle choices uh, are having the greatest impact on behavioural change. So those are just a number of examples in recent times that, that CivTech has dealt with. And there are some hard numbers as well. I mean, uh, and I think it's interesting to think of these compared to conventional accelerators. Um, so, um, you know, uh, the outputs from CivTech have included uh, the creation of, you know, 142 full-time equivalent jobs, um, almost £900,000 uh, to our public finances through taxes, 
uh, almost £600,000 to our public finances through national insurance contributions, over £10 million of, of local economic impact. Um, and in addition, uh, CivTech uh, companies have, have, have won contracts to the value of uh, nearly £12 million investment to the value of nearly four and a half million pounds and and grant income to the value of just over two million pounds. So a huge uh, impact in in the hard numbers. Um, And, uh, you know, it's essential that that there's a sense of that wider benefit in Scotland beyond the public sector. and the, the alliance, you know, the demo days that we've had are, of course, a, a hotbed of, of, of innovation. And um, the alumni, again, of those, of those demo days um, have had a big impact in the market. So um, there's a lot more I could say um, about you know, different other initiatives we've had from uh, our digital commerce service, making government more commercial, um, our investment in the innovation centres, the recent creation of the, um, the the Scottish Tech Army, which is a bunch of private sector organisations that have, have come together and, and I know have had a, a virtual meeting recently with the Lithuanian GovTech team. Um, and uh, we're glad to, to see that that progress um, and also you know, the, the impact that tech has in our economy. Scotland has, like I said, is, is home to a thriving tech ecosystem with over one 1,500 companies that contributed 4.9 billion GVA to Scotland's economy in 2019, mm-hmm. accounting for 3.5% of our total GVA. And um, we're obviously looking to, to grow that. Um, and you know, GVA per head for the tech sector is 40% higher than that of the economy as a whole in Scotland. So it makes it a considerable contributor to Scotland's economy. And this success has, has elevated Edinburgh to the most active tech community in the UK uh, outside London, uh, followed closely by Glasgow in fourth place. So there's a lot of innovation happening here. But um, uh, say there's a lot more, there's a lot we can say, but I think I should probably um, conclude there if there's uh, further. Well, I should say there are so many exciting uh, stories uh, has just been told. And I'm also uh, extremely interested in hearing, you know, that not only digital skills, what makes difference, but the mindset and collaborations that are not measured anyhow, but they are so having huge impact. Mm. And also, um, thanks for sharing with the numbers on the CIFTEC impact on the economy, because it uh, just reveals, you know, that this is a big industry that is not yet uh, uh, exploded across the euro. And us following uh, Scotland as one of the inspirational regions when it comes to the uh, technology and innovation, the public sector, I wanted to say a big, big thank you for uh, joining us here and uh, telling that directly to our people because our GovTech team uh, been to Scotland uh, already, I think, several times. And all of them, they were telling me that, hey, you should really um, have, you know, a closer relations and a better um, examples on the Scottish uh, experience. So, Ben, thank you so much. Can I, can I? Yes, yeah, please. Just, just say in conclusion, um, you know, that collaboration that we have is is so important to us in in across government with, with, with Lithuania and our colleagues across Europe, as I mentioned at the beginning, but on this, um, our shared journey of innovation and, uh, and the collaborative approach we've, ha- we've had so far and wish to continue is, uh, we're so grateful for that. And, um, you know, we all can keep driving what we can. And, uh, you know, it should say that, you know, we've just also announced, uh, we've raised our ambition to support 50,000 households by the end of 2021 um, to become digitally active. So that's a state investment to continue unlimited data and support packages for two years, helping those involved become confident and skilled digital citizens. Uh, So this will be a a total investment of 43 million pounds and one of our most comprehensive attempts to to tackle digital exclusion and the citizen uh, at the citizen level anywhere in the world and um, you know that's in our program for government 
which has, has just been announced. And I, I mentioned that as the final point because uh, I think it gets to the to the heart of of why we do all this. It's it's not just to solve problems and to to perform economically. It's about inclusivity, participation, and quality of life. Uh, and we think that that announcement um, and that commitment that we've we've made recently really emphasises that. Um, and uh, you know, I hope we can continue to to have our dialogue and our collaboration because it's uh, been great to to have that. Uh, internationally with yourselves um, and others so far, and we really, really value it. So thank you. Yeah, um, we will use this um, uh, digital skills investment reference to our local government because we're always, uh, you know, uh, a little bit conservative when it comes to these huge ambitions like uh, Scotland has. Okay, Ben, so thank you so much for your time and sharing with the stories, and we definitely keep connected for the future as well. Thank you. Bye-bye.